serve is. Yes, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, a couple things I want to pray for, just for Israel. Would you keep them on your heart today? Um, and if you can make it to the ordination night, it'd be great. I'm, I'm sure your student pastor would really appreciate that. Okay, so let's get going. Um, you know, you'll probably notice out in the in the lobby above where the coffee is, there's this saying, we spent some time and money on it, that says to make sure that when people come in here, we're, we're trying to, as a church, we're trying to lead people from where they are, which may not be in the best place in the world, to where God wants them to be. We just want to be a, a part of that. And, and you'll notice that when you're out in the lobby. But some people, sometimes we get stuck in the middle of that, between where God where God wants to take us and where we kind of are in the moment. So I want to talk about that today, trying to get out of being stuck. Stuck in between, stuck in the middle, okay? Um, so I, I really believe today's message will be relevant. I do believe it'll be practical and real and personal if you'll let it, if you'll lean in. And if you're visiting what we do, we, uh, we just let the Bible kind of uh, guide us where to go, yeah, okay? So it's kind of our compass, it's our light, it's, our, it's all those things. All right, that, that gives us direction, and we find out what our purpose is. All right, so if you'll uh, if you if you didn't bring a Bible today, it'll be on the screen for you if you need it. All right, but otherwise we'll get going, and I really believe some people are going to be set free with today's topic. I, I really believe that we're all in a place where we can really easily be stuck in bondage, but it's not God's nature for us to be stuck. It's His nature to move us forward. That's that's just the pattern of the Bible is a forward motion with God, right? Um, and not just being stuck. So when I read the Bible, I found out, I Googled it to make sure, right, to see how many promises does God make actually in the Bible. And here's the number. It's 3,573. That's the magic number of promises that's counted in the Bible, Bible that's promises for us and to us, okay? But the reality is a lot of times what we wind up doing is we don't, we don't experience those promises from God because we remain stuck, right? And our job here, uh, what we're trying to do is to grow in intimacy with the Lord and knowledge with the Lord. And so we're going to look out and get kind of unstuck. But there are promises from God. I want to read a few of them just for fun, just to point out that there are promises available to us, okay? Philippians 4.19, which we know, we learned the last couple of weeks that Paul wrote the book of Philippians, all right? To his church, he's establishing churches and things. And here's what he said. And my God will meet all your needs, not some, but all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. There's, there comes a, a benefit, a perk of knowing Jesus, to being connected with him, right? There's, there's benefits in that, and that he, that he will meet all of our needs, not all our wants, right? That would get us in more trouble, all right? But all of our needs. And so in Psalm 84, 11, the Bible says... The Lord is a sun, and he's a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. Okay, that's, that's what is available to us is the favor of God. That's something you can't purchase, you know what I'm saying? And so no good thing does he withhold from those who walk, whose walk is blameless. That means nothing good will be kept from you. Man, we, we learn to step in rhythm, and there's a pattern of obedience in our life. That, man, God loves to give favor. I'm not talking about money. I'm not, you know, talking about that type of thing. That'd be nice. But I'm talking about that favor of God, that joy, that contentment that we can have, that impact we can have on the world. It's available. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. What a benefit. God says, I am with you. We don't have to fear. Other people can walk around in fear. They can live life in fear. But we don't have to. And the reason is, is we have a relationship with God. He is with us. For I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. And here's the promise when he's, your, when, when he's your God. I will strengthen you. I promise I will help you, and I will promise to uphold you. That's to confirm you or support you, right? With my righteous, his morally right, right hand, okay? So that's what comes along with that benefit, that promise from God. So the, the good news is, man, if you're feeling tired today, you're worn out from, from life, you feel overwhelmed and afraid, God said that he is with you, man, and he will give us strength. Supernatural strength that you can't explain and people can't understand outside of a relationship with him. Okay, so there's a lot of promises. Here's one more. 
Psalm 103, verse 2. It says, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. So he's saying that, that forgiveness and healing is yours, and it's mine in our relationship with him, right? So the sovereign God of the universe, man, he, make, he makes some promises to his children, those that know him, that made the decision, decision to follow his son, son Jesus. And it's outside of his nature to break those promises, okay? As a matter of fact, I would write this down. We're a note-taking church because I believe you're going to need it. Um, we take notes in school or maybe for work sometimes, but it's most important when you're, when you're uh, growing in intimacy with the Lord. God cannot. It's something he's unable to do. He cannot break his promises. He can't. And maybe people in your life have and do and will and can but it's not in God's nature to do that, okay? He cannot break his promises. But the, the problem is, man, we're stuck where we are. We want to try to move forward spiritually. Sometimes we don't know how to do that. And so many of us are unable to experience what God wants for our future. We just don't even know what that looks like. It seems foreign to us. So we got to figure out a lot of things. Today's just one of them. Things that can get us stuck, that gets us trapped. Right, that, that holds us hostage from experiencing God's promises. And I'm going to talk about that today. And here's the good news. You don't have to be stuck. You don't have to stay where you are. That's not what God wants for your life. I want to show, show you a few ways um, that can keep you stuck from experiencing God's best. And I don't know if you know this, but it, it is possible to block your own blessings. I'd write it down. There is room for sabotage. It wouldn't be God's fault. It would be ours by some things that maybe before, before today you didn't know. You didn't know that's something that, that kind of got in the way of God's best for your life. But there are things. There are things that we do and don't do that put us in that position of being stuck. So let me bring you up to speed in the story we're talking about today in the Bible. God had freed um, the Israelites. Those are God's chosen people. They were in captivity uh, in Egypt, and he just made a promise uh, for them just like he makes for us. He said, I got another place for you. I, he promised them land, okay? Land, he called it, the Bible refers to it as the, the promised land. It was going to be their very own land. I'm going to take you out of the bondage you're in and lead you to a more incredible and amazing piece of land uh, that will be yours and all your heirs, okay? That's what the promise is, and and, and I just want to tell you this, by the way, that that's what God wants for us. I really believe that. He wants to give us, um, you know, a brand new place in life that is just amazing and beyond what we can create for ourselves or even know to ask for. And so the problem is, and was for them, was they were making some decisions that didn't allow them to walk into that promise and just keep them stuck, stuck in the middle there between where they were in slavery and wandering around the desert and not experiencing God's, uh, the land that he had. They were so close now. They could see it. There it is. They might could smell it. They might could, you know, whatever. It's, it's that close to them. It's within sight. Um, but some of the decisions kept them in bondage. And we're going to see that. And I think, man, we're, if some of you are on a, a verge of what God wants for you and has for you, and maybe even just a good decision or two away from that. So it's really important that you lean in today um, and, and jot some things down. Here's the fir first thing. Is that people that are spiritually stuck, spiritually stuck people, live a life of negativity. I want you to really jot that down. This is a big one. You know, I, I hear people sometimes say, you know, what you got to do is stop smoking. Stop drinking. And uh, You know, yeah, I guess. Yes. Yes. I'm not saying go smoke. I'm saying that, man, this one gets more people off track in their walk with the Lord more than any, anything that I could come with that's a, that's a habit. And the sad news is, if you don't get a hold of this, man, it's going to keep you from God's very best. So the story unfolds like this. There's a guy named Moses. He's the leader. He's, he's the one calling the shots. And he is leading the people, these people out of slavery, and not just out of slavery, but into God's promise, and they're on their way to that. So they're on the edge. They can see it and smell it and all that. They can taste it. 
but he's going to send in 12 spies into the promised land and say, go check it out. Go in there, look at everything there is to look at. Come back and give us a report, right? Because we know God's called us to this. We just need a heads up. We just need to know maybe something to be prepared for, right? And so Numbers 13 says this, verse 17. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev on into the hill country. He's giving them specific directions. See what the land is like and whether the people that live there are strong or weak. Can we take them is what he's saying. Um, are they few or many? What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled and, or, or are they fortified? And how is the soil? You know, if we're going to plant things and live there, it's got to be good soil. So tell us how that is. Is it fertile or is it poor? What do we need to look forward to? Are there trees in it or not? Um, do, do your best to bring back some of the fruit from the land because they, at this time of year, it's the season of grapes. And it's, it's not grapes from food line. You know, they're all nasty. It's, it's even better than Publix grapes. You know what I'm saying? No seeds allowed, all of that. And uh, so they, these are going to be some good grapes because it was the first ripe grapes. But Moses just wanted to confirm God's promises. He thought maybe their report would come back and encourage everybody to say, See, it is awesome over there. This is, God's just not giving us a, a wimpy, falling through with a wimpy promise. This is a big deal. And, but he says, Tell me how things look over there. And I want you to see what they say when they come back. Numbers 13 says, At the end of the 40 days, because that's how long we've gone, everybody else camped out, hung out until they came back. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron, the ones that were the leaders, and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. Awesome. And they gave Moses this account. Hey, when we went into the land which you sent us, it does flow with milk and honey, just like we've heard, just like God said. We got to see it, and here's the fruit. In other words, he's showing all the positives here. Okay, that's what he's saying here, um, that the report that they gave back. In other words, it's just so good, it's just like we thought. But, in verse 28 it says, But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. Those are like giants, okay? They're literally giants. Um, the Amalekites live in the Gev and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites, Mosquito Bites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. So it's just surrounded. It's packed full of people. It's packed full of uh, all these people that are big and strong. It looks well fortified. Verse 30 says, Then Caleb, Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land. We can take them. Uh, for we can certainly do it. Go, Caleb. I love Caleb's. Okay? I don't know any personal Caleb's that I remember. But I love Caleb's in life. They're so awesome. This kind of person I want to be around. He's just not going to put up with the negativity. going to look forward to something. Um, and, and so I, I like Caleb's on my team. There, there are certain contexts I'm reading this from. Like you might apply it to you. There's, there's a couple of big things that God's called me to do. I'm in the process of doing for the benefit of our church. And so, it, I'm, you know, I've got to think it out. Uh, man, it, this is probably what it's going to turn out. It won't turn out like I feel like God's telling me. And there, somebody's going to say no, all that type of thing. And I, you, I'm like you, man. I can get talked out of something real easy. It doesn't take much. Okay? So this is this, the, what they say here is that, you know, they want to... We have to have a different perspective. We've got to see how much negativity tips the scales for us. We've got to understand the impact that it has because God wants to view these giants like the descendants of Anak, like it says, and soon here in a minute, Nephilim, go look it up. They're, they're big, big old human beings in, or whatever in the Bible, um, and he wants to see those as opportunity, not just obstacles, okay? So that when we identify it, God's called you to something, he called you to do something. You're, it's not just going to be um, a clear path most of the time. 
most of the time it's gonna, there's going to be some obstacle that's going to require faith. So it's an opportunity for, for faith, not just an obstacle. Okay? So I like to think the bigger the giant, the bigger the fruit, right? If you're going to go into this land, um, it must be some, if there's some giants there, it must be some really big fruit, really good fruit, right? But if you want big fruit, man, you've got to go through big giants. And some of you experience, uh, you don't experience um, big fruit because you don't want to fight the giant, okay? So sometimes that's just what it is. So write this down. If you want the fruit, you have to be willing to fight. And maybe your context is, man, you know, my marriage, I want my marriage to be a healthy marriage. It's not going so good. Man, it's not like I thought. It's not like we planned. And, and you're going to have to fight for that fruit of a healthy marriage. You know what I'm saying? So I don't want to be a slave to addiction anymore. I imagine a life without that. I, I, I feel like God's calling me to live life outside of addiction. Well, there's a fight involved in that. Yeah, it's there, and it will be better. All of those things, but we've got to fight. And maybe some of you, man, I, I need healing for my family. I need healing in it, man. There's been some things that happened, but there's going to be some, some effort that you have to put into it because God's trying to give us a new perspective about the obstacles that we face. Maybe it's a health situation you've got going on. It's going to have to have a little bit of fight to it, but write this down. There will always be an obstacle to your blessing. God's trying to bless you with something and uh, into a calling in this life. There's always going to be something that pops up. But these negative people keep talking in verse 31. They said, but the men who had gone up to him said, uh, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And, and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They, started, they just started going to other people and saying that because that's what negativity it does. It spreads. Negativity is contagious. I would say more than COVID-19. If COVID-19 and Poison Oak got married, I believe it would be more contagious than that, right? And negativity runs in packs. They love company, right? Negativity loves company. And it's, I, I'm convinced that it, will be a team, it could be a team sport in the Olympics. Uh, let's get together and get really good at being negative, okay? But negativity, the reality is it's a thief. A thief. It robs people, it robs you, and it robs people of their joy. So instead of promoting uh, the, the positive things and going that route, they decided that they were going to uh, get stuck because all they were going to do was focus on the negative. And it goes on and on about that and but they're, what they don't realize, maybe, is they're, they're in jeopardy here, forfeiting God's blessing for them. Okay? They're going to put it off and maybe lose it. And that's, that's not just them. That's for us as well. I wrote this down. I don't know if it's on the screen or not. But negativity literally has the capacity to single-handedly block the blessings and the purpose in your life. It, it, it just does. It can make you hesitate. It can make you pause. It'll make you put off, okay? And it's one of the enemy's favorite tools is negativity. He loves to get that in. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm not messing around no more with negativity. That's done in my life. You know what I mean? And some people say, I'm just being real, all right? But being real, I, whatever you want to label it, it gets in the way. It steals joy and all those things, right? And it's one of the enemy's favorite tools to use. And that's exactly where some of you are. Maybe today, that's how you've lived life. Maybe it's the experiences you had. Maybe it's you didn't notice it until somebody pointed it out, that you're awfully negative. Maybe a, a message like this helps you to realize that. It's, man, I, I do, I'm stuck in that. Maybe that's why my job seems like it's the worst place in the world. Maybe that's why my marriage is, because in six weeks I haven't said one positive thing to my spouse, so no wonder I'm stuck in my marriage. And some of you are stuck in the middle of disappointment or depression, just stuck in it. And that's because you spread negativity about your life and your circumstances. And, but overall, I just want to point out that negativity gets you stuck. It gets you stuck. I wish you'd write it down like this. Negativity is a spiritual issue. It is. It's something that needs to be confronted in your life. Okay? It's something that, that prevents you from progress. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a blocker, that's what it does, and it creates hesitation. It'll keep you and other people around you from taking steps of obedience. It's bad. 
It's bad. It's, it, it's, it's really bad. So we should write this down. My words, things that come out of my mouth, bring death and life. That's Proverbs 18.21. It says this. It says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So a lot of us get stuck where we are because of our negativity. Here's the next thing that spiritually stuck people, what they wind up doing is dishonoring authority. Just can't hold it in. And they wind up dishonoring authority. But people who do honor authority... They position themselves for God's movement in their life. Okay, so there's an opposite to that. It's not just all bad news. There's good news to it, man. If we understand this concept, that negativity causes us to dishonor authority. And I believe this, man. I believe that God's placed every single, in every single one of our lives, he's placed authorities. Whether you agree with them or not or uh, approve of it or not, but it's God's intention for us to have authority in our life, right? And to use it to make us and mold us, whether that authority is, like I said, good or bad, positive or negative, and, and, and shape us and, and shape us into who he's called us to be. So we got, I really believe that, and we got to get that. Um, I believe that he's, he's put people in your life. Um, I wish you'd write this down. As far as God is concerned, maybe not what your husband thinks or spouse or or whoever, as far as God is concerned, honor is not optional. This is a serious issue. There's serious. You know, I, I thought about all those promises that God fits in here. It's 3,537, whatever it was. That's a lot crammed in this little bit. That's a lot. It's almost like double stuff Oreos. How do they get all that in there? You know what I'm saying? And so I feel like when, when something's in Scripture... And God's taking the time to put it in through the Holy Spirit, influencing people to do that. It must be very important. He can't waste one period, one comma, one word, and honor comes up a whole lot. A whole lot. So as far as God is concerned, honor is not optional. It's, in, it's his intention to use authority in your life, to mold us and, and to teach us and all those things. And and, and what happens, one of the side effects of honoring uh, authority in your life, man, somehow you'll be promoted. You won't be able to explain it. God will start to move you. He'll start to give you unexplainable advantage, okay? Not because the, the person in authority over you is a big-time Christian, but just because God gives favor to those that, that honor authority. Because sometimes, man, promises are directly funneled through authority in your life. So we can't ignore this. We really can't sidestep it. We can't avoid it. We can't make a decision about whether we're going to honor or not because it's extremely important, man, in, in God's Word. And the Israelites missed this so bad. It was a big air ball. You know what I'm saying? In front of everybody. Here's what happened. November's four, no, no, November. Numbers 14. I'm ready for Thanksgiving. That's all that means. I'm hungry. Time for lunch. Verse 14 says, That night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. They were really upset. Really upset. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, the leaders. And the whole assembly said to them, If we only had died in Egypt, it would have been better than this. Or maybe just die in the wilderness. What they're saying is, in front of everybody, y'all are bad leaders. Y'all are horrible leaders. Verse 3, it says, Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only let us fall by the sword. Our wives and children will be taking this plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us just to go back to Egypt? Going back to slavery is what he meant. And they said to each other, we should choose a, a leader and go back to Egypt. So their dishonor went from the leaders to God. See how that kind of snowballs on them here? All this negative thinking, they're playing bad scenarios in their mind. So bad that slavery look like a better option. And it gets worse here in verse 10. The whole assembly talked about stoning them. Not the Gaston County stoning, but the kind that kills you, right? They talked about that. Um, and, and stoning them to death. Because, and, and so anyway, 
God always works through authority. He just does. It's, again, another pattern of Scripture. It's unavoidable. So as, as followers, one of those things that we have to change, the Bible, hey, man, I hope that every time you come to church, you're thinking, man, it's God, I'm going because God's going to change something in me. He's trying to make me into something, okay? And when that happens, we, we need to look forward to that. And one of those ways, he's going to confirm our negativity. And what's also connected to that is our, how do we honor authorities in our life? So write this down. Responding negatively, uh, negatively to authorities in your life is a spiritual issue. That's what I wish you'd write down about it. And we can never work around it. And here's what honor means. Honor means to hold in high regard. It means to display value, to value and protect. That's what honor means. If you're looking for a definition, always look the definition up so you'll know exactly what is required when we talk about honor. Because we've been a culture, man, that value, devalues who leads us. No matter who's in office, we're called to honor. You can definitely disagree. You can definitely have an opinion. But not to the point of dishonor. And that's, what, that's one of the things that separates us from this world. It is very popular to dishonor, to devalue, right? And to not protect authority. So we're getting really good as a culture, man, to argue with and become uh, disgruntled and uh, start to rebel against authority. So if you're a student here today, listen to me. You'll be tempted strongly, strongly to um, dishonor authority, right? But if you're a student that, man, I'm trying to follow Jesus and I want to experience the, the blessing of God. I, I don't want to miss out on that. I want to I want to experience that favor of God, man. If you want to get where God has promised to take you, that thing that he maybe not has revealed yet, man, if you don't want to put that off, if you want to experience it in his life, <clears throat> you want to move forward faster, we have to honor God-given authority, okay? Now, everybody else won't be doing that. It makes it even harder to do. But what we're seeing in God's Word, man, we're, we, get, we get the luxury of looking back in Scripture and seeing what the consequences are for dishonoring authority. And I wish some parents would back me up by saying amen or something, but I thought I was preaching good there for a minute. No, they're listening too. And so we have to promote that, parents, as, you know, of honoring authority. It's easy to say, that hey, idiot, he don't know what he's doing. They're just going to copy that. It's How do you find that line where you're honoring? You can still have an opinion and a, a, a deep belief on something, but, but not to the point where it causes dishonor. Write this down. This might help. I honor God when I honor authority. It's connected. Okay? That's why it's important. That's why you can't just blow it off and brush it off and ignore that one. Okay? Because it, it ties in your honor to God in that because it's something that he asks you to do that even the enemies of your life know are difficult for you. But somehow you honor God enough to be able to do that. But the opposite is true, man. When you dishonor authority, man, God will not move you forward. Some of you are wondering why you haven't moved forward. and maybe, maybe this is an area for that, okay? So write this down. Dishonor puts people in bondage. Puts you in bondage. Puts other people in bondage. And you'll never experience everything that God's got for you until you learn to honor people that are in authority. So anyway, Romans 13 verse 1 says, verse 13, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. He's allowed it sometimes. He don't like, like what they're doing or saying, but he's established it. It doesn't disconnect us from having to show honor to it. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Not the sorry leader that don't deserve our respect, right? This turns it into us, okay? First Peter chapter 2, 17 says, it's talking about honoring all people. It says, show proper respect to everyone. Everyone. Love the family of believers, 
fear God and honor the emperor. Okay? So in their context, every leadership that was in their life, he said, because honor is a lifestyle. Okay? It's something where you learn to do that, that, that is, it infiltrates other areas of your life because it brings freedom. Right? That's what it does. And another way that um, people get stuck spiritually, spiritually stuck people focus on fear instead of faith. I'm convinced that negativity is just fear. I think that's at the root of why people are negative. It's fear. And that's where some people get stuck because they focus on that fear instead of faith. And I, I think God wants to reverse that for us. And um, two leaders in the nation of Israel here stood up before the Israelites, and they were Caleb and Joshua. And this is what they said in Numbers 14, 7. They said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good, not just pretty good, exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land. That'll be a telling sentence there. If he's pleased with us, he'll let us go into that land. A land flowing with milk and honey, sounds delicious, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid. There's that fear thing. And do not be afraid of the people of the land because he will, we will devour them. Their protection is gone because once God's on your side, man, what else is left? But the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. So that's two Times we see fear creeping in. That they knew it would. Don't let fear creep in. And don't let fear creep in. Okay? If the Lord's pleased with us, he'll let us know. How we respond to this is key. This opportunity to look at this obstacle as, as, as an opportunity. Let's believe in what God's already told us. Let's just follow through with that. Don't, don't get scared now. And they were trying to build these people's faith. They were trying to speak encouragement into them. And they were doing it using God's own words. All they were doing was repeating what God had already told them. Okay, that's what they were doing here about his promises. But these obstacles were opportunities in disguise, and they didn't recognize this. They didn't see it. They see it as something that's closing the door on them, but the, the people wouldn't hear of it because the Bible says they were spreading negativity and they were dishonoring authority. We saw it unfold. They're, this ain't going to work, is it? Yeah, me too. It, hey, this ain't going to work. And then they start bashing the leaders, and then it rolls into dishonoring God. And that's, we, we watched it uh, unfold in that way. And I'm going to tell you the results of all this is that they stayed stuck. I guess God wasn't pleased with them because he didn't let them go in. And they stayed in bondage, and they were right on the edge, like we said. See it, smell it, taste it. They were right there. Just a half day's journey, I'm sure, to get into it. It was that they could walk into what they saw. And that, but they got stuck because they refused to move forward on what God said. They missed that opportunity of obedience. And they were there for 40 years. That's older than I am. And the only two later, after that 40 years was over, the only two that walked in was Joshua and Caleb. They were the only ones that really experienced that. And if you look back on what they said, they were the ones that were positive. They were the ones that were believing on what God had said and were wanting to follow through with that. So, you know, the Bible's got this way of, who are you in this story? Are you Joshua and Caleb, man? Are you the Israelites, man, that just started getting full of fear and focused on fear instead of faith? And who out of these people got to experience what God had? It's pretty easy. I feel like a Somebody in elementary school could figure that out real quick. Right? And sometimes we have a problem with that. Sometimes it's just because you haven't read it yet. I believe this about you. I really do. I give you the benefit of the doubt. Is Richard, I just, I'm new to the Bible, new to this church thing. When I hear something, though, I'll apply it. I believe that. There are people that have heard it a thousand times, but they've always counted on somebody to tell them like I'm doing and not really reading it and studying for themselves. So when a obstacle, and we know it's an opportunity, comes along. They don't know how to respond. They, all they have left is to, is to focus on fear and not faith. Okay? But what happened? They got to experience, at least Joshua and Caleb got to experience the promises of God. So he kept his promise. 
God did, but not everybody um, did what God had called them to do. So I want you to be like Joshua and Caleb, because I don't want you to wander the wilderness, man, metaphorically. You know, just watching you flounder around and not really have joy and contentment and God's very best just because you focused on fear instead of faith. It, and it, it, it tells on you when you're negative, when that comes out of your mouth. It tells where you are. You're in the wilderness. There's some area of your life where you became fearful and you lack faith, right? And you, so you can't help but focus on the negative things. And I'm, I'm not having it in my life anymore, at least people around me that I'm trying to do something. I need people to be a Joshua and Caleb that says, Richard, keep going, bro. I'm with you. This is awesome. I hear it too, man. I'm, I, I validate the fact that, man, I believe you're hearing from God. We need those people in our life. So please, please don't wear that badge of I'm a, I'm a, I believe in Jesus, I'm a Christ follower, if those two things are mutually exclusive, negativity and following Jesus, okay? Um, so thank you for that. So I've got one more way to get stuck, and it's this. It's spiritually stuck people that just can't move forward, isolate themselves from other believers. They just do it. They find a way. It's sad. It's frustrating to people around you. Um, you know, for, for whatever reason, they begin to isolate. And there's a story about a man on a mat. He's paralyzed. Okay, so he can't move even if he wants to. He can't. If he got the thought, I, I want to move. I want to get closer to, to Jesus, whatever. It's in Luke 5.18 and Mark 2.1. And he's got himself surrounded by some friends, though, that, that knew, that, man, if I can, we can just get him in front of Jesus that, man, Jesus could do something about his circumstances, right? And all throughout Scripture, God has placed people around people, right? And so I love that about our church. I love that we are able to come like this. I do believe you could sit at home and read your Bible. I do believe you could sit on and look at your favorite preacher on TV. That does not a substitute, I'm telling you, if you want to experience God's best, of being surrounded, the opportunity to be surrounded, by other believers. I love life groups in that way. I don't always understand what's being talked about in life group. I don't, you know, sometimes it's over my head. I don't always, you know, go to eat with them, but uh, when some of them go. But there's something about being around them, man, and just being able to hear the things of God, okay? And that, that's a great, a great place to be. So write this down. The right people can move you when you can't move yourself. So don't get isolated. As you hear some bad news or something happens to you, you can get isolated real quick. That's the favorite scheme of the enemy is get you isolated. But you need to get somebody around you who can move you like this man on the mat. He, they had to carry him. He couldn't do one thing for himself to get him in the presence of Jesus. So don't get your counsel from the wrong people, though. This negativity stuff, man, that just can't happen. It can't. And I really believe that, that resisting the opportunity to connect with other people, I do believe that uh, that's an area of disobedience. It's not judgment. It's just I, I say it from a point of I know way, the way Scripture rolls. I know how the pattern is. He puts people around you. And some of you, man, maybe you got this tendency, I'm just going to slip in and slip out. At some point... You, you need to initiate. I need to be around people. Tell me about this life group thing. How can I serve? Because you can be around people when you're serving. Okay? Get to know people. Hey, man, you, I hadn't met you yet. Right? We've got to do that because what happens is the next step, if that gets neglected, is isolation. You start to isolate. And we see how that turns out. Right? So don't get your counsel from the wrong people. So here's the deal. Here's kind of the conclusion. Some of you need to say yes to positive things. You need to change what you're doing. God said it in his word. It's an opportunity to be obedient and understand how much of a block it has been and is for other people to be around you. That is not something that leads them to Christ. It gets in the way, okay? Some of you need to reevaluate uh, the God-given authority in our life. It's, if it's authority, it's God-given. Maybe you don't understand that. I don't either. 
other than God's trying to do something in your life and you can uh, really hamstring God's pouring into you something when you don't honor God-given authority. And, and then lastly, say yes to faith and no to fear. That's what you need to do. Man, I'm, I've been, I'm missing out on the best of what God's got for my life because I'm, I keep worrying. Maybe I've been so negative so long I, I don't see it. But I need to have more, more faith and less fear. So listen, some of you need to figure this out, is that maybe what you thought was best for your life is not God's best for your life. I'd love to see some of you, man, maybe that's a conversation. There'll be people in the back in just a minute. And they'd love to speak with you about that. Like, what are your next steps of obedience? What's God? He's trying to open doors in your life, and you keep holding them shut. God's got his best for you. How do you discover God's plan for your life? I think when you start to see what God's expectation is in his word and line your life up with it, it'll become more and more clear over time. Okay, but that's what God's called us to do. So everything I mentioned today is an obstacle, right? But it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity to grow in intimacy with God. So would you stand with me? The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, everyone, that's everybody, that's all people who call on the name of the Lord will be saved that's a promise we were talking about promises all day today man that that is available to you if you call on the name of the Lord not just because you believe but would you call on his name to save you can you just acknowledge just acknowledge that sin keeps you separated from God that you are sin filled and man I can't do anything about it God but you can He wants you to have a relationship with his son Jesus so that he can pay your debt. You don't have to pay it. He'll pay it for you. You don't want to pay it on your own. That's a place called hell. You know what I'm saying? But he offered a long, long time ago, 2,000 years ago, he went through the action of doing that. Would you receive that? Would you acknowledge the sin? Would you repent? That means turn away the best that you're able it's hard, man, when you've been practicing something for so long, it's hard to see that. Negativity starts to creep in. Like, man, I, I know how hard it is, man. I've been addicted to this for so long. I've been practicing this sin for, I don't see my life without it. It's almost like we're, we're dating. I just can't live without it. I don't know how. I can't see that. But that's what the Holy Spirit's for. That only comes after you, you've received Christ. And there's this supernatural, man, you just call on God to help you with that. Use the Holy Spirit to to give you the strength, right? Like we talked about earlier, the strength to overcome that. Okay? It's a freedom from bondage. But don't let your negativity or the negativity of other people hold you back from God's best. Okay? You're going to see, since we've talked about it, God's always going to put it into practice. You're going to see this unfold in your life. And so I hope that you'll use today to kind of... Receive God's grace in this area and let him uh, give you new life in this area. Okay, would you bow your head and close your eyes? Listen, some of y'all be coming.